Hi, welcome back to the second video of the Diet Architecture series. In this video, I hope to explain some of the design decisions that we made. In particular, the question I would like to answer is, why does the architecture look this way? And before going in depth there, it might be good to make an analogy. When I grew up, my parents gave me lots and lots of Legos to play with. And I quickly came to the conclusion that they were amazing. You could build anything with it. You could make a car, you could make a spaceship, and you could build pretty much everything in between. And the reason why you were able to do that was because all of these Lego bricks clicked together. You were always able to remove parts of a design that you didn't like, and you were always able to add stuff to the design if that meant that your design was going to be better for what you had in mind. All in all, the nice thing about Legos is it is customizable. Depending on what you want to make, it is nice that you can customize in which order you're going to put the Lego bricks together, and that makes it such a flexible and amazing toy. And we tried to do something similar with the design of this architecture. There are many features to like in this architecture, but the one that we like the most is the customizable nature of it. So in this video, I would like to highlight some of the ways on how you can customize this model to your liking. But before we do that, let's just review some of the design decisions that were made. So you might be wondering, with this pre-trained learning that's happening here, odds are that we're using a model that's been pre-trained on the language task. So that might make you wonder, why would we bother doing this language task again with this masking? For starters, we like to think that there is a regularizing effect happening here. But there's also the fact that we are working inside of a chatbot setting. Instead of someone saying hello, in a chatbot setting, people might say yo a lot quicker. And instead of saying barbecue, odds are that people will probably write down BBQ. In a chatbot setting, odds are that people will like to use abbreviated words or shorter versions of words. But let's now suppose that you go to a chatbot that can order you a pizza. You might say something like, gimme Pizza Hawaii. And you might notice that this is in the commanding tense. And the way that you talk to a chatbot, odds are that you're going to use this commanding tense more than you would to an actual human being. Chatbots are not humans. And if you think about the chatbot setting for your own personal domain, odds are it's just going to be slightly different than the actual language out there. Wikipedia has a lot of information about the English language in general if you train on it, but it's not going to be exactly the same as for your setting. So we think masking can actually help you here to learn a better language representation for your domain. Now let's talk about another aspect of this architecture that has merit to it. So let's briefly have a look at these token blocks. You'll notice that we use them in different places. Sometimes we use it in front of the transformer, and sometimes we don't. But there's a couple of small design decisions that went into this. For starters, if you look at what's happening inside of one of these blocks, you'll see that there's a token, then there are the pre-trained embeddings and the sparse features, there's a feed-forward layer, and then they come back together again going through another feed-forward layer. One way of interpreting this is that these feed-forward blocks, they can attempt to perform a small correction on what came out before. As mentioned previously, these pre-trained embeddings are great, but they probably don't know about the details of your domain. For example, there might be some jargon that's different. The token bank can mean two things. It can be a bank on the river, and it can be a bank in a banking setting. And being able to correct for that is a useful thing. Notice that we're using these token blocks in multiple places. It's not just the tokens that go into the transformer where we use it. There's also a token block here in front of the class token, and there's also one over here, which is the label for the mask. Now, let's think about the gradients that these blocks will receive. 
The gradients that come in here and here eventually come from this entity loss. As well a little bit from this intent. And the same thing happens here. But we also have a loss over here that comes from the mask. And because we have all these different signals, you might imagine that these blocks are trying to learn something that is rather general. These token blocks have to learn a decent representation of the tokens that go in. Be it a class token, or be it a token that we're using for the masking as a label. And we like to think because these token blocks are responsible for multiple losses, but also in multiple parts of the architecture, we like to think that we can capture a lot of information in these. Because remember, these token blocks, they share the weights. Let's now shed a little bit of light on this transformer block. I will not go in depth again in this transformer. It deserves its own video. But what I do hope to do here is just demonstrate something interesting that is happening here. We have a couple of numeric vectors that are going into this transformer block. And I'll just represent their values with colors. Now, what is happening inside of this transformer block is we have an attention mechanism as well as some other architectural designs such that these vectors that will go in, they will influence each other. And there's a representation that is learned that is gonna go out. And the hope is that the representation that goes out will have just a little bit extra context. Now, as we see here, a few things will go out and go into the conditional random field. But for the mask, we've got a separate branch and we've also got one for the intent classification from the class. But let's zoom in on this one specific example though. What will this context here look like? Well, one might assume, considering all the words that go in, probably the word play is going to be very relevant for the intent that you wanna play a video game. So you might imagine that the context that goes out here it's gonna be a combination of this blue vector and this green one we had. In this particular example, you can imagine that it's these two vectors that will have the most effect on the classification of the intent. So we've got this gradient path from the intent over here. The intent loss is gonna cause a gradient that eventually will make its way here. But in a situation where the play token has a lot of effect on the intent, you can also imagine that a large part of the signal is gonna go back here. And I can also draw that out in more detail in the diagram above. And again, I should stress that this is only for the intent loss, but you can imagine that a very similar thing is happening here with the entity loss as well. And also with the masking loss. Not only is the transformer that we have here giving us a little bit more context going out, it also allows us to allocate different losses more appropriately to different token blocks as well. With the design decisions reviewed, let's now have a look at how this gives us good options for customization. Let's say that I am building a assistant. And let's say that this assistant has it easy. It's a assistant that will work on a familiar subset of the English language, and there aren't too many bells and whistles that we need. It might even be the case that we don't need entities. And if that's the case, then we can just say, you know what, just ignore this part. And maybe we also do not need the mask. So we can tell the algorithm to also ignore that. And because this assistant only has to focus on the intents, we might choose to have a slightly bigger embedding layer size. But let us now consider another type of assistant. And let's say that this other assistant, well, this one's got it hard. It has to cover a lot of the English language, and there are lots of intents that we have to worry about. 
Well, in this case, you can choose to turn on the masking again. And also, you can choose to put a big pre-trained model in the pipeline as well. This way, this pre-trained part of the pipeline will be active with a heavy model. Note, though, that because of the design, we don't necessarily have to completely from scratch retrain this pre-trained model. Because we've got these feed forward layers here, that will compensate for a lot of domain specifics. One thing that we can do, though, is just make these layers slightly deeper and slightly bigger. We can also choose to add more layers to this transformer. The base setting has two, but we can have more. Another thing that we can do is we can consider doing some pre-processing. Typically, we will make lots of features in our pipeline, and we are going to incorporate those in Diet as well. And generally, there are two types of features. Sparse ones. These are typically things that are one-hot encoded. So think of character engrams, maybe some regex results. These are sparse features. And alternatively, we have perhaps dense features. These might be some numeric vectors that you've pre-trained or some extra information about the user that you have at the ready. Now note that these dense features, we can just append those here. As far as diet is concerned, these are just extra dense features that we have at our disposal. And similarly, we can also add sparse features by making sure that those get attached here. Suppose a new version of BERT ever comes out that you can just plug and play that in here. This includes new versions of BERT that are trained on bigger datasets, as well as multi-language versions that might be interesting. Let's now consider one final type of assistant. Let's now say that we've got an assistant and this one is going to be very, very lightweight. This is an assistant that perhaps has to work on a Raspberry Pi. Well, then also here we have some things that we can tweak. For example, we can say that we just don't want to use any pre-trained model whatsoever. This is one thing that will make our model much more lightweight. We can also make the choice to turn off this feed-forward layer. We can again make the choice not to do any masking. And we might also say, hey, you know what? Let's just do one layer here for the transformer, just to keep it lightweight. There's a setting that says how sparsely connected we have these feed-forward layers. These feed-forward layers are sparse. We delete about 80% of all the weights in them, but we can choose to maybe delete 90%. And finally, we can also make the decision to take these embedding layers and to just have them be more lightweight. I hope you recognize that the diet architecture is very flexible. Just like Legos, we can choose which Lego bricks we like to use and which ones we would like to ignore. Also, there are many hyperparameters in this architecture, but I hope you would agree that the interpretation of each parameter is quite well understood. We can optimize the hyperparameters in a somewhat principled way. It's not that we have a black box where we just have to fiddle with the numbers, it's that we can upfront imagine what each hyperparameter might do in the model. And we think that this customizability of this architecture is going to be the thing that makes the difference. Assistants in a chatbot setting typically have to adapt to a very specific domain. So we want to have a model here that's flexible. And the diet architecture covers a lot of ground. So let's wrap up. I hope this video helped your understanding of the diet architecture and that you appreciate which design decisions were made and why. I also hope that it's clear how customizable the current approach is. The main feature of the Diet architecture is that you can customize it to your domain. Diet is also a standard now. So when you install Raza version 1.8.1, then you will notice that Diet is the standard machine learning approach. In the next video, I will show you how you can use this. I will load up a demo project inside of Raza tweak some of the settings, 
and I will show you how you can run benchmarks using a diet architecture. I will also compare it to the previous approaches, and I hope you'll stick around for that.